Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm not sure I should say this, but I'm Clayton Rose, the president of Bowdoin College. <laughs> it's great to have a packed house here. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are thrilled to have uh, Senator Susan Collins with us here. Thank you, Senator, for being here, and welcome back to Bowdoin. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to uh, remind or let you know that uh, we are live streaming uh, this event to uh, our alumni, parents, and friends of Bowdoin. Um, Senator Collins doesn't need an introduction, but nonetheless, I'm going to provide one. Uh, Senator Collins is Maine's senior United States Senator, and in the tradition of someone that she deeply admires, Margaret Chase Smith, uh, is a leader who's gained the admiration not only of her constituents here in Maine, but uh, of the entire nation. She was first elected to the Senate in 1996. She ranks 19th in Senate seniority at the moment and is the most senior Republican woman. She chairs the Senate Aging Committee and the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Subcommittee and serves on the Intelligence as well as the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And from 2003 to 2007, Senator Collins served as the co-chair of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. She has earned a national reputation for working across party lines. In 2004, she co-authored landmark legislation that overhauled the nation's intelligence community, making it more effective while at the same time protecting our civil liberties. In 2010, she led the Republican effort, Republican effort to uh, successfully repeal the military's discriminatory don't ask, don't tell policy. And in October of 2013, she again led a bipartisan group uh, to develop and implement the framework that led to the ending of the 16-day uh, government shutdown. For the last three consecutive years, she's ranked as the most bipartisan member of the U.S. Senate and recently received the inaugural Jacob Javits Prize for Bipartisan Leadership. She is also known for her main work ethic. Senator Collins has never missed a roll call vote and has logged over 6,200 votes in her time in the Senate. Senator Collins is a native of Caribou, Maine. She is a graduate of Phi Beta Kappa of St. Lawrence University, great liberal arts education, um, <laughs> and joined the staff of then Congressman uh, and later Senator William Cohen, Bowdoin class of 1962. She was appointed uh, by uh, then President George H.W. Bush to head the Boston Regional Office of the Small Business Administration and later was the founding executive director of the Center on Family Business at Hudson University in Bangor. Senator Collins was last here in 2014, where she gave the greetings from the state of Maine at our 209th commencement. And we are thrilled to welcome you back to Bowdoin, Senator. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So here's. Thank you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, ask the first few questions to get us warmed up, limbered up, and then we're going to turn it over to you. And we have microphones down on either side of the aisle. I uh, will invite you to queue up. Uh, my request would be that you uh, keep the questions in the form of questions and try to keep them concise uh, so we can get as many, uh, as many questions in. Um, so, Senator, I'd like to start with a question that I suspect is on everybody's mind and that relates to the political environment that we're in today. But you're on record and have been for a while as not supporting any of the four candidates that will be on the ballot in two weeks for the presidential election. Um, can you walk us through what must have been a very difficult decision for you to make? Absolutely. First, let me thank you for inviting me here to Bowdoin tonight. It's a great honor to be here at the college, which has just recently been named the best small liberal arts college in the entire country. So, congratulations. And I'm delighted that my sister, Nancy Collins, who is a member of the class of 1976, is also here this evening, as is my husband, Tom Daffron. So, I wanted to acknowledge both of them as well. So 
I am, as you know, a lifelong Republican, and I have always supported my party's nominee for president. So the decision to not support Donald Trump was a very difficult one for me to make, and it's one that I thought a lot about. Eventually, it really came down to three points for me. The first was when Donald Trump mocked a reporter who was disabled. And then he denied mocking the reporter who was disabled, despite the video that clearly showed that that is what he had done. Second was when he questioned the ability of an American judge of Mexican ancestry to rule fairly in the case involving Trump University. He said that the judge who was born in Indiana and was as American as Donald Trump could not possibly rule fairly in the case because he was Mexican, is what, what he said. And that, to me, showed a profound disrespect, not only for this individual judge, but for the rule of law and for our judiciary. Most troubling was the third incident, and that is when he attacked the religion of two Gold Star parents who had lost a son in Iraq. He showed absolutely no empathy for their loss. And I couldn't imagine anyone, much less a presidential candidate, having no empathy for grieving parents and then attacking their religion. There were many other incidents, both before and after I made my decision, which I made public in August. But what all of these had in common, in my view, was that Donald Trump was attacking people who lacked either the platform to respond in most cases, or because of their professional responsibilities, such as in the case of the reporter, could not respond to his outrageous attacks. And that led me to conclude that he did not have the temperament to be our president and to represent our great country. I was also concerned that he might make a perilous world even more dangerous because of his lack of knowledge when it came to foreign policy and defense policy and his impulsive nature in the way that he reacted to either perceived or, or real insults. So after that, despite uh, being a loyal Republican, I just concluded that not only could I not vote for Donald Trump, but that I had to make my views publicly known. And I did that in a column that was published in the Washington Post in August. And although I've taken a fair amount of grief for my position, I don't regret it because I believe it was the right thing to do. What I intend to do is to write in the name of someone for president. <laughs> Uh, but I, I couldn't support my party's nominee. Thank you for sharing that, for the candor with, with which you shared that with us. Let me stay on politics for a minute and um, shift slightly. There, in, in virtually all surveys that I've seen of millennials, there's a deep distrust in general of institutions in America and in particular of Congress. Um, why do you think that is? And how do we encourage and find ways for smart, gifted, talented younger people, our Bowdoin students, to find their way to a life in politics? Well, there's actually a survey that shows that Congress has a lower approval rating than either cockroaches or colonoscopies. <laughs> and I, I must say that I've always found that rather discouraging. <laughs> um, 
And I do think it's a serious problem. And I will say that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders both tapped into a current of disconnectedness and distrust in our public institutions. It doesn't just apply to Congress. I think it even goes to the Supreme Court, which is very troubling to me. It goes to uh, even institutions of higher learning. It goes to our financial institutions. There's a distrust of any institution that is perceived as powerful and out of touch. And as someone who comes home from work in Washington every week and works really hard for the people of Maine and this nation, that really troubles me. That disconnect, I think, is due to, to many factors. One, and this is an area where I actually agree with Donald Trump, um, we've seen poorly negotiated trade agreements cause mills to close, and people who have worked hard their entire life are suddenly, through no fault of their own, out of work. And if you lose your job and you're 52 years old and not in great health, and you're in a small mill town in Maine, you do feel betrayed by those institutions that are supposed to reward people who work hard their whole life. The stagnation of wages that we've seen, where people have worked really hard and still can't get ahead, they can't advance up the economic ladder, I think is part of that feeling of disconnect as well. I also think that members of Congress have created that disconnect in some cases by talking down the institution to which they belong. They keep saying that Congress is corrupt or that um, it does the wrong thing all the time and that votes are bought and sold. And I will tell you that is just not accurate. It's, it is accurate that there are few bad apples, as there are in any large institution, but that does not reflect the Congress that I know. But when you have people feeding in and inflaming that feeling of disconnectedness, and they're part of the institution, then people tend to believe it. I think it's a real problem. The hyperpartisanship is reflected not only in Congress, but in this country. As more and more we see what sociologists call residential sorting, where Democrats tend to live in urban areas and in inner suburbs, Republicans tend to live in rural areas and outer suburbs. And it used to be it was much more mixed and that people who, um, it, that you had neighbors who didn't think exactly the way you did. And finally, I think another cause of this disillusionment with institutions is due to the 24-7 news cycle that we have where there are radio shows and cable television networks that reinforce what people and social media outlets that reinforce what people already think so that you're not exposed to alternative viewpoints. And that means that instead of seeing, um, if you're a Democrat, seeing Republicans as people who simply have a different viewpoint than you do, but want the best for our country, you're more likely to see each other as enemies. And that's a real problem for our country. So let me follow that up. Um... Uh, and, and, and ask for those of our students who may have some notion of an interest, and other, other young Americans who are out there, may have an interest in public service and in political life, but see this rancorous, deeply partisan uh, institution or set of institutions, how do you describe for them the joy, the satisfaction that you get out of the work that you do? Well, 
First, let me say, because I realize I didn't answer the final part of your last question, that I started out on Capitol Hill as a congressional intern for Bill Cohen, class of 62. I have to put in, I realize each time I say his name now. And that was during, my internship was 1974, and it was during the Watergate summer. And I saw this freshman congressman stand tall and vote to impeach as a member of the Judiciary Committee. He voted to impeach President Nixon, the president who belonged to the same party that he did. So I saw that example. And I remember arriving back home in Caribou and three days later, Nixon resigned. And I so wished that I'd still been in, in Washington because it had been so exciting. And I also had a great role model in Margaret Chase Smith, the legendary senator from Maine, who was senator the entire time that I was growing up. So I went into government and politics with a more positive attitude than many people have today. We offer paid internships in all of my offices in the state of Maine and in Washington because I want young people, regardless of their family finances, to be able to have the kind of experience that I had. I was paid $50 a week, by the way, and I had to eat a cheese sandwich every day at lunch because it was the cheapest thing on the menu. And that allowed me to go out with the other interns on Friday night. But <laughs> Some things never change. That's right. right. And uh, I would say to you that you can do so much good. And this country is never going to get back to where it should be, where people work together and we get beyond the gridlock and the excessive partisanship if you sit on the sidelines and if you don't get involved. It has been the greatest honor of my life to be Maine's United States Senator. And I feel that I've made a real difference. And that's what keeps me going. We were talking earlier about how beautiful the Capitol is. And when I look at the Capitol at night, and oftentimes my nights are very late, and the Capitol is all lit up, and I still feel this sense of inspiration. And the day that I feel jaded, or that I don't feel that, then I don't belong there. But as long as I still feel that I can make a difference for the people of Maine, and I'm inspired by the Capitol, and I realize that I can bring people together uh, to craft legislation that matters to our country, such as the, in the wake of 9-11, when we revamped our intelligence agencies to make us safer, or the leadership that I provided, the first Republican on, the first Republican to step forward to be the lead Republican co-sponsor to repeal the discriminatory policy of don't ask, don't tell. And I know that I made a difference on that. And I know that I make a difference to Maine veterans who are World War II veterans nearing the end of their lives who never got the medals that they earned in World War II, or to a community that is revitalizing its waterfront and I'm able uh, to get them, help them get a grant, or a program that I wrote uh, the language and provide the funding for that helps homeless and runaway youth. That is so satisfying. And I think there are very few professions where you know that you're really making a difference in people's lives. Teaching is one of them, where you really know that you're making a difference. I'm sure healthcare is another. But that's what I feel like, and that's why I really believe in government. Thank you. All right, time for questions from all of you. Tony, we're gonna, we've got um, microphones. If folks want to come down, if they've got questions, I'll keep 
firing away up here. Um, let me, I have another one. I want to, I'm sure we'll have some political questions, but let me pivot to the state of Maine. Um, Maine is a state where the population is static, likely shrinking, where it's aging, and I believe we're the oldest state in the union we now. Are. What about this worries you, and what is it that uh, we can be doing to encourage younger people to either remain in the state or return to the state? Well, first of all, we have to get past the myth that there are no jobs in Maine. There are jobs in Maine, and I think we can't talk down Maine. We have to realize that in addition to the wonderful quality of life that we have, that downtowns in Bangor, in Norway, in Eastport are being revitalized and we're having uh, more attractive, uh, more attractions to young people, whether it's better restaurants or uh, plays and theater and sports events that help keep people in our communities. But I think oftentimes that there's this pervasive feeling that young people have to leave Maine in order to get jobs. And I know from touring businesses all over the state, whether it's machine shops that need machinists, or whether it's high-tech firms in the Portland area that need scientists, that there's a lot we can do. Let me give you a specific example of a project that I've been involved with. Uh, on, on Mount Desert Island, Jackson Labs and MDI Biological Labs now have internship programs for college students and for high school students so that you can come and see that you can be a world-class scientist and stay right here in the state of Maine. Now, I'd like to go beyond that. I'm after Jackson Labs, which, as you may know, breeds mice that are used by researchers around the world. I say, why isn't there a Maine-based company that makes the food for those mice and provides the bedding for those mice and the cages for those mice? We should have a whole cluster. Uh, there's been work done on specialty foods in Maine. Maine has a mystique about it. Maine, Maine blueberry jam, believe me, will sell better than New Jersey blueberry <laughs> jam, you know? It's true. With all due respect to people who are from New Jersey in the audience. The cat's out of the bag on that, I think, Senator. Right? All right, why don't we turn to... Uh, our first question here, who's, who's up here? I can't quite see the face, but fire away. Uh, hello, Senator. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here this evening. You mentioned uh, a little bit earlier uh, the 24-hour news cycle, sort of alternative media. And so my question then is, for you in your own life, sort of how do you get your news? How do you get your information? How do you sort of say that that combats this issue with um, this 24-hour news cycle that we're clearly experiencing? Uh, that's a great question, and fortunately, I have a staff who puts together <laughs> a selection of clippings from all different sources, and that I have by 8 o'clock every morning. So I skim through that, and I also make sure that if I'm watching television, I jump around. I sometimes watch MSNBC, although don't tell the rest of my Republican caucus. <laughs> and I sometimes uh, watch Fox, so don't tell my Democratic friends that. But, but that's sort of my point, is that we need a variety of news sources. And I tend to wake up in the morning to NPR, which I think uh, probably is the most balanced. In, it's news coverage, and um, which I've just now, I'm really in trouble with every network and every <laughs> radio show. But I try to watch a variety of, of news sources. I also, uh, every day, read parts of the main, all of the main newspapers. And um, it, the New York Times, I get the daily summary. 
and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. The problem is you just can't possibly do it all, which is why I'm very grateful that my staff does summaries of the news for me and articles that I should, uh, I should read. And that includes social media, too, from Huffington Post on the left to Daily Caller on the right. And I hope by looking at so many different sources that I can get a more balanced view of what's going on. Um, I'll tell you what's really interesting, though. It's when you're really involved in something in Washington, and then you read how it co was covered, and you think, were we at the same event here? <laughs> because that happens as well. Thank you. What, oh, go over here. Hi, Senator. My name is Justin J. Pearson. I'm a government and legal studies major. I uh, study American politics, so the best season for that. Thank you for joining us. And I guess after the 2012 election lost by Mitt Romney, a platform was created that was supposed to sort of reshape the way that the Republican Party would move forward. Now, after 16 candidates, uh, two years worth of an election, and Donald Trump's existence, the Republican Party has been changed quite drastically. And fortunately, there are people like you who are bipartisan and are shaping the Republican Party in a positive way. But moving forward, after this election cycle and the tensions that we've seen rise across the country, what do you believe the future of the Republican Party will be or will have to become in order for it to become a party that's more inclusive of the America that is changing? Thank you. Thank you. You are absolutely correct that after the loss by Mitt Romney, there was a review of the Republican Party that was carried out by the Republican National Committee. And one of its findings was that we needed to be more inclusive, and that is certainly true. Well, if you think about the 16, I think it was 16 candidates that we had for president, we had two that were, of, were Hispanic Americans, um, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. We had a woman, Carly Fiore, Fiorina. Fiorini. Thank you. Yeah. I think I'd remember her name better than that, right? And um, we had an African-American and Ben Carson. So actually, if you looked at the Republicans who were running, it was a very diverse group. Uh, we had Jeb Bush, who is married to a Mexican-American. And we really had a very diverse group. Um, I will. I will fully uh, concede that I never, ever would have guessed that of that diverse group, we would end up with Donald Trump. <laughs> and, and I wish that we had not. There were many other candidates that I think would have served the party as well as the country um, more effectively. After this election, I think there will be another reassessment. In fact, I've already been approached uh, by three different people about getting together after the election and looking at what currents gave rise to Donald Trump and, this, and how can we, um, what should be done about that. Now, I do want to make clear, so that's not misunderstood, Donald Trump, whether I like it or not, won fair and square. He did win the primaries and he won um, caucuses. I personally would like to see every state have a primary rather than caucuses the way we have in Maine, because caucuses, first of all, attract far fewer people. And if you think about it, they disenfranchise a lot of people who can't take the time off from work to go up here at someone's home or a local school or wherever the caucus is being held. So I think if you had primaries, you would have a broader group of people choosing who the nominee is. One reason we're seeing the polarization that we're seeing right now is that in the House, this doesn't apply to the Senate, but it has an impact on the Senate, 
in the House were seeing gerrymandered districts, which are made safe for one party or the other. Well, if they're a safe Republican district or a safe Democratic district, then the primary is everything, and the people who tend to vote in the primaries tend to be more representative of the extremes of both parties, the far left and the far right. And in many states, most states, independent, unenrolled voters can't vote. So you tend to get, in those districts, uh, people who are more ideological and less pragmatic in their approach. Um, so I think the gerrymandering, which both parties engage in, is part of the problem. Can I just follow that up, Senator, and ask a question? Do you, do you think that we are more likely, in the aftermath of the election, that the Republican Party is more likely to break in the direction of the group that, and it's a large group, that supports uh, Donald Trump, or to break in the direction of the platform that was put together in the aftermath of 2012, that was seeking a more diverse and, and broader constituency? I truly don't think this is wishful thinking on my part. I think that the party is going to be, adopt more of the recommendations uh, that occurred four years ago in the wake of Mitt Romney's uh, loss. If you look at that analysis, it really is pretty hard-hitting, and it talks about the need to be in a more inclusive party. And I think that's the direction the Republicans will go in, because otherwise, we're not going to win elections. I mean, if just for practical reasons, um, as well as policy and philosophical reasons. And when you look at a lot of the younger leaders in our party, there is a lot of diversity there. And I think that will be reflected in the direction that the party goes in. Hello, Senator. Thanks once again for coming tonight. It's truly an honor. Um, my question is not unlike what we're talking about right now. Um, recently, Donald Trump has come under fire for uh, saying that he may or may not accept the results of, uh, of the election. And um, I'm wondering what your thoughts on are, uh, what your thoughts on that are in regard to like the effects on the party going forward, even the, the bipartisan system going forward. Um, there's a lot of more liberal news outlets sort of taking it to the extreme and saying it's a call to anarchy. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious to, to what your thoughts are on that. I was alarmed when I heard Donald Trump say that because one of the traditions of our country, of which I'm most proud, is we have always had a peaceful transfer of power. And the loser of presidential elections has always accepted the outcome. And I'm thinking back when uh, John McCain lost to Barack Obama. He put out a very gracious statement who said, in which he said, he is our president now. And I'm thinking back also to the famous Supreme Court case decided by a 5-4 decision in Gore versus Bush, in which uh, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of George Bush. And Al Gore said, it's over, it's done, and George Bush is president. And he could, have been, um, he could have been disrespectful of the Supreme Court's ruling, particularly since it was so close. But even in cases like that, uh, the person who lost has, has not only accepted the results, but has affirmed the presidency of the person who won. And um, I... It'll be interesting if Donald Trump does not prevail what he does do, and my hope is that this was just uh, fodder for his supporters and not something that he will in any way follow through on. If he did cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election, it would be a terrible step for him to take. 
You know, one of the problems is we're, regardless of who is elected president, there's going to be a large part of the population deeply alienated from that person, whether it's Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. And that worries me. And I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to give advice to the next president to tell him or her uh, that they need to come forth and reach out to Congress, try to identify some bipartisan issues where we can come together and do something that would be popular with the American public and well received. And I've, I've got three suggestions for them. Um, biomedical research investment is one where we really ramp up, which uh, the Republican Congress has done the last uh, four years, the investment in biomedical research, so that we can cure or, or come up with a means of prevention for our nation's most costly disease, which is Alzheimer's disease. And I think that would be one. I think tax reform would be another, to unite around the goals of a simpler, fairer, more pro-growth tax system. And third, I think rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, which is a problem throughout this country and has an impact on the economy of our state and, and virtually every state, would be a third. And that's the next president is going to have to start healing the divisions in this country. And that's, that's one way to start doing it. Please. I'm wondering what your views are on human-induced climate change. I'm wondering why it is that our Congress continues to support billions of dollars of subsidies for oil companies. And I'm wondering, lastly, what it is you think we can do here to put a light of fire on the Congress to do something about this. Well, first of all, let me say that I believe climate change is clearly occurring, and I believe that humans are part of the problem, I mean, our activities. Um, I also believe there are natural variations in climate over time, but clearly human activity has exacerbated the problem. I have been, in studying climate change, I've been to Antarctica, and spent four days there visiting with scientists. In fact, one of them was from Bowdoin. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a great conversation with him. Um, and uh, the University of Maine also has scientists there, but sadly, one of whom was just killed. Um, in a snowmobile accident. But I've also been to the Arctic to study climate change. And I've met with native peoples in Barrow, Alaska. That's not the pretty part of Alaska, I can tell you. It's right on the Arctic Ocean. And for the first time, and this was, oh, eight years ago, I think, the permafrost was melting and telephone poles were starting to lean over. And they were seeing insects that they'd never seen that far north. We've seen, I consider this a public health issue as well, the incidence of Lyme disease has skyrocketed in the state of Maine. And the reason is that the tick that carries Lyme disease didn't used to be able to survive the winners in Maine. And now it's climbing up further and further. Each year, you can see more and more cases so that even Aroostook County, where I'm originally from, had some Lyme disease cases last summer. So it's a public health uh, threat as well. Um, I am, as far as what you can do and what I can do, um, I have introduced and co-sponsored a number of bills. One is aimed at fast-acting pollutants, um, sort of super pollutants, super greenhouse gases, like methane is one, for example. Um, another would start a program, and it's not 
that expensive at all to replace the very dirty, sooty cook stoves that are used in developing countries, particularly in Africa. They're terrible for the health of the families that use them to prepare their food, but they're also responsible for something like 18% of the soot that is in the atmosphere worldwide. Uh, this is going to require a global approach. We obviously uh, contribute considerably to the greenhouse gas emissions in this country, uh, but we're not the sole emitter by any means. And indeed, China and India are projected to pass the United States as emitters of carbon. Uh, I have voted repeatedly to do away with the tax breaks that, uh, that the large oil companies get. And I have supported over and over again the ability of the EPA to advance uh, greenhouse gas emissions policies, the Clean Power Act, for example, of which does not make me popular in coal states, I can, I can tell you. But I think we need to help those workers in coal states. See, we can't, we can't uh, put very strict new regulations on coal-fired power plants, which I support, and then ignore what the impact is on coal miners. And that's what's the problem sometimes with, with our policies. So uh, Maine has had, have been a leader in this area with our regional greenhouse gas initiatives, which is a, essentially a, an auction of uh, greenhouse gas em emissions permits. And that money has been plowed into uh, both commercial and residential programs to reduce energy use. All of us can make a difference in the habits that, that we have. Uh, we can buy more fuel efficient cars, we can walk more, uh, we can change our light bulbs to LED lighting. There are things that we can do as individuals to contribute to uh, to solving this problem. But ultimately, it's going to require governmental action as well. Hello, Senator. Um, sorry. Uh, it, so at, in your job as a senator, you have to look after both the interests of Maine and the interests of the United States of America. Um, and my question is, are there times when those interests conflict? And if there are those times, or if there were to be such a time like that, what would you do in that situation? Uh, very good question. And it's a question that I've thought a lot about. I always ask myself when I'm confronted with a difficult vote, what is the impact on Maine and what is the impact on our country? And since Maine only has two senators, the way every other state does, uh, <laughs> obviously. But I put Maine first because I feel that if I'm not looking out for the state of Maine, the senator from, I'm picking on New Jersey tonight, New Jersey as I'm going to. <laughs> so um, Maine is my first priority, but oftentimes there really isn't that much of a, of a conflict. But those are two questions that, that I do always ask. And, um, you know, part of the problem when you're a centrist is votes that are very easy if you're on the far left or the far right quickly become very difficult. For one thing, and the Clean Power Plan is a perfect example. I was the deciding vote on that. And I voted against an amendment that would, this, that would have stripped EPA of its authority to regulate greenhouse gases. And this was an interesting coalition of coal state Democrats and Republicans joining together. And I was the deciding vote. 
Now, in that case, I felt that I was putting both Maine's interests first and the country's interests first, because Maine's at the end of the pipeline, and although we don't have coal-fired power plants in Maine, we get the pollution because of the prevailing winds. Oh, there was one more point I wanted to make on, on the carbon. I am a huge supporter of offshore deep water wind energy. I, I am really excited about that, and Maine has the potential to be the leader in the world um, in this area. And the nice thing is about deep water offshore wind energy is you don't have the issues of being able to see the, the turbines. And wouldn't it be great if Maine became the leader in that, not China, not Denmark, not the United Kingdom, all of whom are pursuing it, but Maine, and then we manufactured the composite uh, turbine blades here in Maine, creating 10,000 jobs. It, that's, that's the kind of thinking we need to, to have. But uh, to conclude with you, to answer your question, I put Maine first, but there's usually, I don't see a big conflict. Thanks, Senator Collins, for coming to our school to do this talk. Uh, so recently, the Senate just approved a $1.15 billion uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia. So I was just wondering why we continue to arm um, Middle East states um, with weapons such as fighter jets and Apache helicopters, um, when one, a strike on Iran might be the, the worst possible result uh, for our country, and two, a lot of these weapons that are being sold are resulting in civilian casualties. This was a difficult vote, and Angus King and I had a big, long discussion about it on the Senate floor, and the administration was very strongly for the arms sale. I'm just giving you context before I um, get to your question. And um, two-thirds of the Senate voted to allow the sale to go through, so it was a lopsided vote. What is happening is in Yemen, a country that I visited several years ago, and uh, one, of the, one of the worst places to live that I can imagine, um, Yemen is in the midst of a civil war. And what you have is Iran financing and arming one faction, and then you have the Saudis financing and arming another faction. I think um, that it is a very dangerous situation because if there is not stability brought to Yemen, it is going to be a safe haven for ISIS or it is going to be a client state for Iran. And both of those outcomes are dangerous uh, to our country. So I believe that the Saudis are our allies, although I, they have been inconsistent allies in the war against terrorism, but they have been fighting ISIS and Iran is not our friend, and I felt that it made sense for the arms sale to go through. Um, it was not an easy vote, but if we did not provide the Saudis with the arms, frankly, they were going to buy them elsewhere, so it's not like it was going to stop arms from flowing into Yemen, and it would have further destabilized and strengthen the hands of ISIS and the Iranian proxy, the Houthis. Hi, Senator. So I was interested in hearing your denouncement of Trump earlier. Um, however, earlier you also acknowledged that either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton is going to be the president of the United States after this election cycle. Um, so I would also be interested in hearing about why you are choosing to write in a candidate as opposed to supporting Hillary Clinton um, in this election cycle. Um, that's, a, <laughs> that's a very valid question. 
that I expected tonight. Uh, surprise. Uh, you know, first let me say that I worked well with, with Hillary when she was my colleague in the Senate. And should she be elected, I expect to work well with her once again. But I am deeply concerned about two issues uh, that to me shows that she is a flawed candidate. One has to do with the whole email um, scandal server issue. And here's what bothers me. I listened very carefully to the director of the FBI when he made the decision that there were not grounds for indictment. And I accept his conclusion in that regard. But he also said that she had been extremely careless, that was, those were his words, in handling classified information. And on a subsequent uh, show, on one of the Sunday morning shows, when Hillary was being interviewed, she said essentially that she had been exonerated by uh, Director Comey. And she hadn't been. If, if anything, he was extremely hard on her, but found that it did not rise to the level of a criminal indictment. Um, so that her misrepresenting what the FBI's findings were really troubles me. The second thing that troubles me is the whole role of the Clinton Foundation. It seems to me that when when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, she should have had, this is a time when a wall is appropriate, she should have had a wall between the foundation and the State Department. Instead, there is all this email traffic back and forth that so-and-so has been a big donor and a good friend and a generous benefactor of the Clinton Foundation and really wants to see the Secretary of State. And I think that's inappropriate because at best, it, it created the appearance that if you gave a lot of money to uh, the Clinton Foundation, and there's some, some countries uh, that are, are really dubious actors that did give a lot of money to the Clinton Foundation, countries that have been horrible on women's rights, for example, uh, that then you could get to see the Secretary of State. And there's never been a good explanation for those emails, and that really troubles me. So for that reason, I cannot vote for Hillary Clinton either. And, uh, but I do expect that she's very likely to be our next president, and I'm certainly, I certainly anticipate being able to work well with her. Uh, so, Senator Collins, thank you so much for being here. It's very refreshing uh, noticing about what's going on in 2016 that you've got a kind of voice of reason. Um, and I really admire that. But my question. But, <laughs> I, I knew there was a but coming. <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned that there were 16 Republican candidates for president, and it seemed that, you know, there have been very few of them that have kind of stood up and mustered the courage that you had in denouncing Donald Trump. And so um, my question is, 70, about 70% 70 of the Republican primary, you know, either put uh, cast votes towards either Trump or Cruz, who, in my opinion, could be equally as divisive as Donald Trump and could espouse some of those values that run counter to uh, the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Muslim surveillance, for example, uh, of communities. And so, but there has been a real kind of deep root that Trump has been able to hit on the, he uh, on the head and reaching out to these folks who feel disadvantaged, discouraged. And so how do we reconcile the fact that those same people seem to also be believers in uh, this kind of racist, xenophobic, sexist talk? And then how do we move forward and how can we as partners at an elite institution like Bowdoin work with you 
because I think you're going to be very instrumental in moving uh, the whole country forward and kind of reconciling these actions and being the America that we all know we can be. Well, first, I don't agree with the characterization that most of the other candidates were xenophobic or Islamophobic or um, homophobic or, you know, the list goes on and on. So I, I really don't. And in fact, uh, the candidate whom I supported, Jeb Bush, um, has said that he will not vote for Donald Trump and has been outspoken about his comments on, on Muslims, on immigrants. He's been very outspoken on it. Um, Carly also w remembered the debate where she confronted him on his attitude towards women. And so I don't think that most of the candidates, I, I know several of the candidates, Marco Rubio certainly does not share those views. And as far as, as what the difference that you can all make is, I think we need a renewal within our own communities. And we need to get to know people who aren't just like us. That's why this residential sorting that I mentioned, where you may go, you may live in a neighborhood where there's not a single person who isn't just like you, or who isn't, you know, maybe a, a different political party from you. And I think we need to step back as a nation and rediscover the traditional American values that made our country great. And those values to me are a sense of community and caring about one another, tolerance, empathy. Those to me are American values that a respect for one another. It's, it's Donald Trump's utter lack of respect for other people, particularly people who are different from him, that caused me to reject him. We teach children not to bully people, uh, other children on the playground. He apparently missed that life lesson <laughs> somewhere. And, um, and I think all of us need to engage in rebuilding a sense of community in this country. Um, and that means getting to know people who are different than you are. And it also means on college campuses being willing to listen to ideas that are different from yours, which is why I'm very grateful to be invited here tonight. I guess I just said. <laughs> but, you know, there have been colleges that have disinvited commencement speakers because they didn't agree with their views. Condoleezza Rice was disinvited. Uh, the head of the World Bank was disinvited. I, I think that that's appalling. Uh, there is a famous Muslim woman activist whose name escapes me right now who was disinvited from Brandeis. And we can't have that. And liberal arts colleges are well suited to lead the way in this renewal of American community and a sense that we care for one another, that a sense of tolerance, empathy, personal responsibility, individual freedom, those are core American values. And I'm worried that in this era of blaming others, of inflaming prejudices, of sorting yourselves out so that you only socialize and know people who share the same views that you have, is very bad for our country. So my charge to you all is to help us rebuild that sense of community. 
people are very down on Congress, and I understand that, but I'm reminded of a story that Lowell Weicker, the former senator from Connecticut, once told. And a constituent came up to him and he said, the constituent said to Senator Weicker, you know, all of you senators are just a bunch of liars, thieves, and womanizers. To which Lowell calmly replied, well, it is, after all, a representative democracy. <laughs> so, uh <laughs> I love that story because it shows the obligation that each of us has. I can't do it alone. I, I have been rated the most bipartisan senator year after year after year. I started a group in Congress that is called the Common Sense Coalition in the Senate that brought an end, that laid out the framework that brought an end to the government shutdown in 2013. We had seven Republicans, six Democrats, and one independent, Angus King, and we worked together. And there is a core, but we need support from America. We need people who want to see government work, who understand that a compromise is not only not a dirty word, it often is the best solution because it takes ideas from both sides and that we've learned to listen to one another again. And we can't do it alone. We need we need more of a community-based grassroots support. And what better place for it to begin than at the best liberal arts college in the United <laughs> States, right? Well, I think having said that, our evening is coming to an end here. Um, let, wonderful questions and amazing engagement from the Bowdoin community, and, and uh, no surprise. And, great and wonderful candor from you, Senator, so thank you for that. I'd like to finish on the following thought. The, um, your uh, predecessor, uh, several times removed, Margaret Chase Smith, whose seat you hold, once said, public service must be more than doing a job efficiently and honestly. It must be a complete dedication to the people and to the nation. And at Bowdoin, we think about that as serving the common good, and you truly and clearly serve the common good, and we are grateful for that, Senator Collins. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank much. you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really Thank you. 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 Sorry, we have a little something for the senator. <laughs> that was my reaction. Right. Right. So Thank this is a little you. something to remember us by. It fits under the Senate gift requirements, <laughs> and it's a Bowdoin Thank polar you. bear for your desk. Oh, so, wonderful. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.